And that's sort of our goal. The thing to keep in mind is that HTML is responsible for everything concerning the appearance of the page. The way that it's physically laid out, the way that it looks, the fonts, the color choices, all that are set via the CSS. And the HTML just contains the content and sort of the basic structure of the page. So we went through a variety of different methods. We used, uh, first of all, we just used what's called the flow layout, where things just flow one on top of the other. Then we went to absolute positioning, where we can nail things down in a particular location on the page using the top and left. Then we use relative positioning, where we can take the position that the browser wants to put something in, that is the normal flow, and adjust that so that we can move things around a little bit. And um, then we added a container um, so that we put everything inside a container and then that container um, uh, we could do some positioning on as well as doing some positioning within the elements within that container. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to cover probably the trickiest of all concepts relating to positioning, and that is the notion of floating. All right? I'm going to try to explain floating to you um, with, with a, a couple of drawings, then we'll see examples of it, um, and then we'll actually go and revise our site to use a, a floating layout. Now, good thing about a floating layout is that it's very flexible, and it allows you to make something that can work on either a desktop browser or a mobile browser. So if there's a trend in web design, it would be towards floating layouts because, again, those, those allow for greater flexibility between mobile, desktop, laptop, tablet, any of those kind of things um, work, uh, work good for that. The idea of floating is like this. And we'll take a simple example and we'll, we'll build on it. But if we have a page with a certain width, Let's say this is the width of the browser, which depends on the actual device, but maybe it is, you know, 1,280 pixels. That's a typical potential sign of, of uh, a window. When we say that we're going to float something, we can typically float things either up to the left, to the right, or down. Typically, we float things to the left. And what that means is when I say float to the left, it means push it as far to the left as it can. So let's say we have something that is 600 pixels. And I tell it to float left. It will push it to the side. And it will take up 600 pixels. If I then have something, let's say I have another 400 pixel element that I want to float to the left. It will try then from the left up this element. And if there's another, it will put it there. So in this particular case, if the window was 604 can sit side by side. So it would put the 400 alongside the 600. So we're up to what? 1,000 now. Now if the next thing that we had was 300 pixels, and we tried to float it from the left, it can't fit those 300 pixels, these other things. So it would drop underneath. So the whole idea of floating is seeing, is there enough space in the window to fit the next thing in? And there either is or there isn't. If there is, it puts it alongside of it. If there isn't, then it drops it down to the line below. So that's the whole idea of floating. And when we talk about floating to the left, we talk about pushing things from the right to the left over, over uh, into the window. 
Now, that's a simplified example. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make um, a page with just a couple of sections that I'm going to style. And we'll play around with the floating to see how that works. When things start to really get complicated is when you add in things like um, use percentages instead of um, numbers. And when you have percentages plus margins and padding and all that kind of thing, that's when things get a little tricky. But the, the basic concept is the same. Does it fit next to the thing that's on its left? If it does, it puts it there. If it doesn't, it puts it below. That's the whole idea of floating left. So let's go in and let's make a page we're going to start with a brand new page here we are going to not not um, not do our example yet. We're going to make our own page. And for simplicity, I'm going to put the CSS in the same file as this, because this one we don't really need to reuse. It will just be helpful for us to have everything all in one place. So I'm going to go in and put my doc type and my basic HTML in. I'm just going to put two sections on the page. Alright, so there we have just two sections. Again, without any CSS, what's this going to look like? Well, it's just going to look like stuff did the first few weeks of class where the things are just stacked on top of each other. Because this is simply following the flow. So I will say... open this up in Chrome. So there's section one and section two on top of each other. Now I'm going to give them some properties just to make them visible. All right, just to make them more visible. I'm going to give them each a background color and I'll give them a border and, and stuff like that. Actually, I'm going to start out just giving them a background color. I'm not even, even going to give them a border. So I'll go in here into, and again, just because this is not an example that I plan on reusing, I'm going to put the style right into the HTML. And I'm going to say section. So all my sections I want to make having a height of 200 pixels, a width of 400 pixels, and a background color of yellow. So 
when I do this, we see we have our two sections. All right. So far, I've done nothing with the positioning of them. Therefore, they're in the flow. One is simply stacked on top of the other. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have both of them float to the left. So I'm going to say float left. So what will this do? This will see if there is room on the, within the browser window for this to be on the same line as the element to its left. Well, this first one, of course, there's going to be enough room for it, right? Because there's nothing else there. The second one, though, is going to be iffy. It depends on how big the browser window is. When the browser window is fully expanded like this, I forget how big this monitor is, but it's probably a thousand and some pixels, so therefore there's going to be enough room for it. But as I make the browser window smaller, at some point there's not going to be enough room for it and it's going to drop down below. So, go in and save this. And notice the start, they're right smack dab next to each other. And, oops, as I make the browser window smaller, at a certain point, it gets smaller and drops down. It doesn't get smaller, but it, it, it gets, the browser window gets smaller. There's not sufficient room for this guy to be next to the thing to its left. And therefore, it, pop, oops, it pops it down to the next line. All right? Pretty straightforward, right? Now, um, a few things. Notice that um, there's absolutely no vertical space between them, and there's no horizontal space. Um, that's because of what? What could I do to put a little bit of space between them? Well, padding will put space between the edge of the container and the text or the content. What, what is the space between elements? That's margin, okay? So it goes margin is between the space between two elements. Then you have your border. Then padding is the space between the edge of the element and where the text starts. So let's go and add. We'll start off by adding a margin of, we'll make 40 pixels. That puts 40 pixels between them. And if the screen's wide enough, it will put it in next to each other. Otherwise, it drops it down. But it puts some space in between them. Let's change that to 20 pixels. Now, one thing about margins is notice that there's the same margin on the left and on the, uh, uh, between here and the edge of these and between the two. Margins don't add up, all right? So if this guy has a 20 pixel margin and this guy has a 20 pixel margin, I don't get a 40 pixel margin. Th this is called margin collapsing, all right? What it does is when I say that there is, if I say there's a margin of 20 pixels, between two things. If I say pixels, it and put there's a top pixels and a pixels. Essentially, I satisfied both the margins, right? Oh, and I'm not showing that. All right, if I put 20 pixels between these, 
then I've satisfied both the margins. In other words, the second one is at least 20 pixels below the first one, and the second one is also, or the, the top one is also 20 pixels from the bottom one. So it doesn't add up margins, it collapses. When you specify a margin, it says, I want, it, I want this much space between elements. So if there's that much space in there, it's fine. It doesn't, like, add them together. All right? It's a little confusing at first, but it, it makes sense, you know. Both of those have their margin condition satisfied if there's 20 pixels between the two because there's 20 pixels from the bottom of the one to the top of the next one. There's also 20 pixels from the top of the one to the bottom of the next one. All right. Let's go and add, I'm going to make them a little smaller so we have more space. I'm going to add a border and a padding. All right, so I made it so that they're 300 wide, so there's more space. The margin is 20 pixels. That means that there's 20 pixels between them. The border is two pixels, black and solid, and there's five pixels between the edge of that and that. So again, margin is the space between, border is the border around it, padding is the space from the border to where the text starts. So if I was going to add up, the total width of these, that'd be 20, you might have to help me out because it's a Monday morning, 20 plus 2, that's 22, plus 300, that's 322, plus 2 more, that's 324, plus 20, that's 344, plus 2, that's 346, okay, 346, plus 300, that's 646, plus 2, that's 648, plus an extra 20 margin here, so that would be 668. Okay, so this whole thing is 668 wide. So the idea is, is if it can fit it in, if the window is bigger than 668 pixels, it will fit everything in alongside of each other. So you can actually like do the math to figure out precisely where that break point is going to happen. And as I get it narrower, when the screen, when the window gets right about here, it's going to break and put the one down below. So narrower, 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 right about, oh, I lied, there. It's a little off with that, but there you go. At that point, it breaks because it cannot put it next to the thing on its left in the available space. All right, things get complicated when you start mixing percentages with absolute numbers. It gets harder to do the math. You could still do the math, but this isn't an algebra class, so we're not going to do the math. We can add, but we're not going to solve al algebraic equations here today. All right. So, for example, I could make the width of this, let's say, 30% instead of 300 pixels. All right. In which case, when, it was, when the window is, say, 1,000 pixels, all right, the width of that will be 300 pixels. And then the padding and, and all that will add up like it was before, and it will be 668. But as I make it narrower, all right, um, if I make uh, the window, say, um, 800 pixels, then each of those won't be 300, but they'll be 240. So the total will be 120 less than, than um, the 668. 
So that will be 548 will be the total width of those and so on. So making that at 30%, I must have forgot to save it. All right. When the screen is all the way, it probably looks about the same as it did before. But as I narrow it, that gets smaller and smaller. Until it can't get any smaller anymore. All right. The window won't let me it won't, won't let me get it smaller than that. Let's change this to 40% because I still want it to break and all right there at that point it becomes smaller. Now one thing that's often done especially with mobile devices is using this approach along with a minimum width, all right? Because notice how it keeps making it smaller and smaller and smaller. We don't want that to be beyond a certain size. We don't want it to get smaller than a certain size as we get smaller. So we could put a minimum width in here in addition to the width and allow for some resizing and some flexibility, but not to where things get to be very, very tiny and very small and not readable. This is sometimes jokingly called a jello layout because with a jello layout it wiggles a little bit, so it changes its shape a little bit, but it doesn't completely collapse like a liquid layout would. So I'm going to make this with a minimum width of 200 and it will go but at a certain point I lied. Alright, there we go. I must have forgot to save it or refresh or something. At a certain point, it doesn't get any smaller. So as you can imagine, this is something that, that's very good in, in a mobile environment. And it's also good if you have people that have gigantic screens, for example. One thing that's a characteristic of mobile, uh, mobile uh, layouts is mobile layouts tend to be simpler than um, layouts for a desktop browser, simply because the screen is smaller um, and, and for other reasons as well. So, a two column layout that looks great and works well on a uh, desktop browser might be changed and reduced to a one column layout on a mobile device. Let me see if I can pull up an example real quick without having a mobile phone here.
Actually, we can see it right here with ESPN's website. ESPN's website is developed, um, and, and more and more websites you see this a case of, of being where they look different depending on if you're on a mobile site or a, um, a desktop. Notice, for example, that here on a desktop with the window fully open that you have two columns. Now, we're not on a phone. How can we simulate that? Well, one way to simulate that is to make our browser window very narrow. So on a phone, it might look like that. Notice how it has changed. It's no longer a two-column layout, but it's a one-column layout. And that stuff Actually, I think just plain disappears. All right. So this actually gets beyond what we did in our example because it actually made certain content disappear when it gets smaller. And that's what we will talk about probably next time is different layouts for mobile um, applicate our mobile websites than this but the step in the right direction is to make things um, at this point the, the 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 preceding step to making it look completely different on a mobile device versus a desktop device is to use percentages and also use um, floating layouts so that you change between two and one column notice how even the picture changes width depending on the size. So with a narrower screen, even the images and the videos get smaller. At least some of them do. Again, if you're having trouble with this, if things aren't working the way that you expect them to, that's where you do things like putting a background and a color in. So for example, let's say there was no background and color on this. I just had these two elements floating. If it was confusing why that goes down there, again, what do you do? Well, you put in the background and the color, and that will show you actually how big that element is, and it will show you how and why the, the, the thing is laid out the way that it looks like it is. Questions about this? I remember, this is just a, a bare bones exercise, right? Um, it is not um, a particularly useful one in that very few people want to want a web page with two big yellow blocks, one that's labeled section one and one that's labeled section two. All right? If you do find someone that needs that, this is your solution. All right? But what we're going to do now is we're going to go and we're going to use the same techniques with regard to um, the um, layout that we had been working on previously. Yeah, uh, if you have a one column layout, you, you don't necessarily need floating. You're right. If, if you have a one column layout, you probably don't need floating. 
you probably could just as well do it. You probably could do it with floating still, but you, uh, you don't really need floating with that. All right, because uh, one column layout, the whole idea of floating is putting things next to each other, side by side. So if you're not doing that, then yeah, that, that's not, not why you would do it, or, uh, or that's not what you would do. Um, keep in mind that these are all like tools in your toolbox. Um, you know, you, you look and you find a situation where it would apply and, and you use it and adapt it there. So what floating is effective for is if I had a web page that I wanted to look, um, uh, have a multi-column look on a wide browser window, like a desktop or whatever, and I wanted it to have a one column you know, so multi-column that collapses to one column is really the, the, the way that you do it. And that, that's a pretty common model for a lot of websites. But you're right, it's, it's not the solution in all the cases. So I'm going to copy this guy and make it five. And I'm going to go into style. And I'm going to ignore the container in this one. And I'm going to start out by putting float left on all of these. I'm going to just change the positioning that was in number four to say float left. So let's look what number four, let's look at what number four looked like. Number four looked like this. Now let's look at what number five looks like. That's number four again. I say, see, it looks the same. It's a similar layout. Except the CSS is a lot simpler. Let's compare the CSS with the one with the CSS with the other. In number four, We had to do all those goofy negative margins, all right? And what's wrong with those? What's wrong with those is those are very imprecise, all right? Uh, in other words, if I go, or maybe they're too precise is maybe a better way to put it. The point is, is that they're fragile. If I change something, if I make, for example, the navigation taller, I no longer want it to be, have a top of 120. I might want it to have a top of negative 150. All right? So it's fragile. What I mean by fragile is you make a change in one place and that change affects everywhere. All right? Uh, and so if I make the navigation bigger, then all of a sudden it moves that guy. With the float, you don't have that problem. Because the float, I don't specify any absolute numbers. I simply say slide along to the left of the different elements. So this is less likely to break. Now, a couple differences. First of all, some of these things I'm going to make 
width of 75% and 75%. I'm going to change the margins just a little bit because I'm going to try to get the same look with the float as I have for the other one. All right, so there I'm nudging that over. I can nudge over a little fiddling, I have this looking about the same. Now at a certain point notice it collapses. Well I can take care of that simply by putting a minimum width on the navigation. So I can say min width 150 pixels or something like that. Now notice what happens. At a certain point, it collapses to one column. Now, if I get rid of the borders, the borders kind of make it look a little goofy. If I get rid of the borders here, This very well might be the layout that I would want to uh, want on a small phone or something similar to that. And then as if I was on a larger browser window, that might be the layout that I would want for a bigger browser window. Again, you may have to tweak this a little bit um, to get it exactly the way that you um, would want it. But uh, that's the general idea of that. So notice that this accomplishes pretty much the same thing that Relative did except it's a little more straightforward and it's a little less prone to failure. So if the, the navigation became taller, that doesn't mess this up. Whereas in the other example, if the navigation became taller, then I'd have to adjust the um, negative margin to be a larger number, a larger negative number. Questions over any of this? This kind of stuff has always been important in web development. It's always been important to try to accommodate the different platforms that your user could be seeing this on. Um, things are just more complicated now, now that there are mobile devices, tablets, phones, gaming consoles. All these are different ways that you can view the same page. So that makes something like this much, much more important. Now there's a variety of techniques that you can use to make your site look good both on a desktop and a mobile um, device. Um, there's a whole class devoted to that, uh, mobile web development, where we focus on a number of different things that you can do to sort of optimize your page. 
Um, in this class, we're just learning the bare basics of that. All right. In this class, we're learning what you can do to make one website look respectable in both a desktop environment and a mobile environment. But we're not really looking at doing things to optimize our websites in a mobile environment. That comes in CISS 268. Um, which is mobile web development, a, a class I encourage all of you to take. Um, at this point in time, it's unthinkable to think, it's unthinkable to think of, if, does that make sense? It's unthinkable uh, to not consider um, how your website's going to look like on a mobile phone. It, it just, you can't do that, you know. A certain number of years ago, there was a small percentage of people that use their mobile for, um, um, so, you know, for, for navigating through the web, but, you know, now it seems like everyone has a smartphone, or at least a lot of people have smartphones, and as such, uh, that becomes important. Yes? I, I read that, uh, online that people who use the internet nowadays, only one in four who use the internet don't even use a regular network. Right. Right, I, and again, I, I know people like that, either through apps, such as like, instead of going to the Facebook website, they would use the Facebook app, so that would be one way that they would do that, or use a mobile website, like, you know, Facebook.com is viewed on a mobile device. So, yeah, um, absolutely, that, 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 that is a, um, one out of four people never using a, a desktop computer or a laptop, that's probably a very reasonable um, statistic. Um, it is hard sometimes to get statistics like that, simply because, you know, you don't, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, you can get some statistics for a given site, but to make blanket statements like that, it takes a little bit of research. So sometimes you have to take statistics like that with a little bit of grain of salt but that definitely sounds like a reasonable statistic I don't think that one's out of line at all that one isn't just a bogus claim what's the difference between accessing the web on your mobile phone versus accessing it on a computer what are some of the differences that come into play number one is speed all right typically on a desktop or laptop computer, you are going to have a faster internet connection. All right. You're going to have typically more powerful hardware. All right. Although the power that mobile phones are getting these days <laughs> may not be as big of a deal as it, as it was back then. But again, the, mo the most powerful computer is still is always going to be more powerful than the most powerful mobile device, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, so speed is a consideration. What other considerations are there? The screen size. All right. Um, you know, you're going to be dealing with a physically smaller screen. Even a tablet is going to be smaller than uh, the, typically the screen. Now, a tablet could be comparable to the screen of a laptop, but um, a screen uh, on a tablet is typically not going to be as big as a screen on a desktop. And a screen on a mobile phone is going to be smaller than the smallest laptop screen. All right. Any other considerations? Those are two good, those are two great examples of how surfing the web via mobile device is different than, than surfing the web on uh, a desktop or a laptop. How you interact with it is different. Clicking a link versus touching a screen. All right. Typing on a keyboard as opposed to using a virtual keyboard. That, that's a difference. Another difference, though, is a little more subtle. And it doesn't have to, to do with the um, actual equipment or actual devices or hardware or software even. It has to do with the mindset of the person. Are you apt to look on the web for different stuff if you're using a mobile device versus if you're using your desktop computer? Let's say you're visiting LC's website. It, let, let's say you want information about what degree programs are out there in computer information systems. 
How would you typically access that if you had a choice? On a desktop or on a mobile device? I wanted to see all the different programs that were available for CISS. A desktop, right? You probably would look that up on a desktop. All right, why is that? Why would you, I, and I would agree with you, most people if they were looking for that kind of information probably would use a desktop. But why? Bigger screen. So it's e okay, small screen, everything's smaller so you have a bigger screen that's easier to read. Okay, um, there's a lot going on. The point is, is that investigating, if I could summarize this, investigating the degree programs here is not simply getting a quick answer to a quick question. All right? It's taking some time to read the information. So a bigger screen would come in handy. All right? It's not something that you're going to go to one page and have your answer. So you're probably going to navigate between several pages and look. Look up networking and look up software development, look up mobile development, and look up web development, and so on. So it's a more lengthy task, and it's a more task that requires more thought, more reading, more navigation. All right? What might be something that you would use LC's mobile visit? Uh, LC or any college's mobile website for? When would you use your phone to access a college's website? Yeah, to, to answer a straightforward question. When, when is the fitness center open? What are the fitness center hours? All right. Um, we had a, a preview of this over the weekend of, of a very common reason for using LC's website, right? We got a little bit of snow over the weekend, right? So, is the school closed? <laughs> That's something you might want to look at on the mobile website. Again, the difference is, and again, the, 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 the differences go hand in hand. There's some differences that arise out of the differences in hardware and software on a mobile device versus a desktop. But the other differences emerge from the difference in the mindset of the, pers of the typical person accessing it via the, the, a mobile browser versus a desktop browser. A desktop browser user is going to be more apt to spend a lot of time or spend more time and be more thorough looking for answers to questions that aren't necessarily like yes or no or absolute answers. Whereas a mobile user is probably looking for a specific piece of information. All right. Um, now for some sites, it's probably the same, right? Like for example, if I was accessing a, a restaurant's website, if I was using a mobile browser versus a desktop browser, I'm probably looking for the same information, like what kind of food do they have, when are they open, you know, how do I get there. So there might not be that much difference in the design of a mobile website for a restaurant than uh, the desktop version of it. But for a school or a site that has a lot of pages and it's very involved, there's liable to be a big difference in how you choose to lay it out. So, next time we'll look at some of the techniques that you can use to make the website look different um, on a mobile device as compared to on a desktop or laptop. Now, all of these start out sort of with our number five example, the floating example that we did today as sort of the basis, and then we'll expand upon that. So be sure that you understand that. Now again, I copy, uh, I, I upload each example file along with the video. So like if you want to see like today's stuff, it will be the set of files right underneath the video and likewise last week and so on. Any questions? All right, we'll see you.